Amen. Jeremiah 23, quite a chapter there, quite a lot going on. You look at some of the things he's saying. He's, this is a strong accusation coming from the Lord, speaking through this prophet. He's telling us that the prophets, the priests, the pastors, the shepherds, the leaders, they're preaching lies. They're telling you things that are not true. They're not putting forth the word of the Lord honestly. And God is saying, I'm going to judge you. Uh, you know, there's, there's prophecy in here about Jesus speaking of the branch, of uh, the Lord of righteousness. So there's a lot happening in this chapter, but he keeps going back to this thing about the word. Like, hey, they're not speaking the right word. They're not seeking my word. If they had my word, they would have turned from their ways. They would have changed things, but they're not. As people of God, we as Christians, we are called to love the words of God. And listen, man, I love the Bible. Amen. I love the Bible. The more I get to talk about the things of the Lord, the more I get to talk about the Scriptures with other people, the more it excites me. The more that I get to read the Bible and just see what the Lord has for me. There's, it's as hid treasure. There's treasures in the pages of the Bible. And we should absolutely just love the Bible. We should be in love with it. And, you know, I had somebody ask me this past week, uh, well, how do you think that they are going to make the Bible illegal. The question was coming from a perspective that in the end times, the Bible will be completely illegal in America. Now, certain portions of the Bible are illegal in Canada and in Germany and certain countries like that. And so that's the premise. The thought is, well, in the end times, before it all wraps up, surely the government will crack down and they're going to kick in your house and get your King James Bible or something like that, right? And that is kind of the, the intent of the question that was asked to me. And, you know, I've heard things like that growing up, but I no longer think that's the truth. Why would the devil have to make the government cause the scriptures illegal when he's made your cell phone so seductive? When he's made the television just so tempting? The games, the programming, the content, the video, the music videos, it's all doctrine that comes straight from the devil. It's teaching you morality. It's teaching you how to make a judgment call in life. And I love the Bible because the Bible, you know, I mean, the name of our church is Law of Liberty. This means the Bible. It is the law that will set you at liberty. It's God's commandments that give you freedom. We're free in Christ. Thank God the law has shown us our sin. And by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we have true liberty. We are free forevermore. We have been made free and nobody can take that from us. Now, God has preserved His Word for us. He's given us the gift of the Holy Scriptures. You have a copy in your hand. You probably have a dozen copies at home. You probably have one in your truck and one under your car seat. And, you know, the Bibles are everywhere these days. And, you know, they're at the dollar store. And I, I love the Bible. The more time I get to listen to the Bible read to me, I love it. The more I get to read the Bible for myself, or especially to read it out loud, I absolutely love it. The more I get to hear preaching, of the Bible. I love it. I really do. And in the end times, I think that that love is going to wax cold. I think especially in Christians these days, our love for all the cares of this world, the distractions that are going on, I think, I think it's causing our love for the scriptures to just kind of grow cold. Almost as if the Bible is old news. Did you read that newspaper? That's last week's newspaper. Think about it. The scriptures are perfect. They're timeless. It applies to you. On every page, there's good doctrine. It can teach you how to lead your life. I want to talk about how to be fired up for the Bible. I want to show you from the scriptures about why we should be fired up from the Bible. What does it look like when somebody is just fired up about the Bible? If you would, here in Jeremiah 23, look at verse number 28, please. Verse 28 says, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? What a statement. If you have God's word, let it let you. You should speak it faithfully. You should open it up. 
You should read it to others. You should get it in your heart. You should be true to the Word of God, to the context that's there. You should not twist the Scriptures. You should not abuse the Scriptures. You should share it. It should be like a flashlight that you shine in this dark world. That's our job. Uh, he says, what is the chaff to the wheat? We're not worried about the chaff. We're, we're the wheat. We're God's chosen for our faith by choosing Him. And because of that, that we're the sons and daughters of God, we have a point and a purpose, yet we have the words of the living God that we need to share with people. He says, he says let Him speak my word faithfully. That's our job. Look at verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like as a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Now, the Word of God is called many things in the Bible. My focus today will be about fire. But if you notice here, he says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and as a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? God's Word is like a hammer that can just crush and destroy the false prophets. It can destroy, the, it just smash the satanic slander against God and against His people. And everywhere we turn in this world, you go to the grocery store, there's magazines and they're preaching satanic doctrine. Look, you don't see little red devils and horns on it. But the things that they're putting in your eyes and the eyes of your children go against God and against His Word. You go, to the, you go to a restaurant and you sit down and there's music coming into your ears that's trying to draw you away from God and do things that God has warned us about and live in a way that God calls filthy and debased and we should not go down that path. If you would go to James chapter 1. Go to James chapter 1. The Word of God is called a hammer. The Word of God is a tool. And we need to use this tool to fix the bad doctrine in our life, the, the mental issues, the baggage that we have, the spiritual oppression or possession. The Word of God has the ability to fix just about anything. And the problem is we just don't, we just don't use it. You know, for those of you that are into alternative medicine, you know, the, the apothecary in your closet, you know, we all have a, well, you all you got a little bit of this, and if you've been around me long enough, I've probably prescribed oil of oregano for something, or apple cider vinegar for something, and look, I mean, those two, between those two things, you can cure a lot of stuff, right? And, and now think of this spiritually. Hey, brother, I'm having this problem at work. Oh, 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 I got, man, I got it. It's right here. I got what you need. I'm having this issue with one of my children. It's rebellion. Hey, man, look, I've got what you need. I, this is just what the doctor ordered. My family, my spouse, if we could just get on the same page, think about it. How many times do we truly practice what we preach? Or, here's what, it ought to be we ought to preach what we practice. And if you'll practice to go to the Word of God, and then you preach it to the world and say, hey, I know how to fix your problem. You've got to go to the Word of God. The Word of God, the Scriptures, the Bible has the solution for all of your problems. God says it's a hammer, and we've got this problem, and God says, I can crush that. God calls it a fire. And again, here's the problem. The television has become the prophet of our generation. It's like a faceless prophet with an ever-changing face, right? And it is teaching bad doctrine. And of course, it's easy to pick on the TV. Some of you say, well, I don't even have a TV. Okay, well, how about your phone? Do you have social media on there? Are you, I mean, are you addicted to YouTube, Facebook? Are you playing games on it? What is it? Because the devil is using technology and videos and music to steal your heart and to teach you things that are contrary to the Word of God. And if you want to get fired up for God or for the Word of God, then you have to be willing to reject the things that are stealing your time and stealing your mind that have become a, an idol, if you will, in your life. Too many times we don't want to let it go. The Bible is called many things. It's referred to as many things. A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Some of you men carry a flashlight every day. Everyday flashlight. I, I started carrying one years ago. I love it. And I don't hardly ever need it until the lights go out. But when it does, man, I've got it. It's good. We're good to go. Why? Because I won't stumble. I won't fall. I won't go down the wrong path. God's Word will shine a light that will help us to know. It will protect us on the paths of light. We can see the right way if we'll see it in the light of the Word. It will keep you from real danger. You can see what the terrain is really like. 
you can see the real danger. Think about it. The Bible is called an anchor. It's called, uh, in Hebrews 6, it calls it the anchor of the soul. Now, what is an anchor for, for a ship? Well, that's to keep it from going astray somewhere it ought not to be, or from beating itself to death on the shore, right? Or destroying oneself. You're in James chapter 1, if you would, find verse 22. James 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. <laughs> not just hearers. I showed up Sunday morning, I heard what you said, I went home, I changed nothing. That means you're a hearer only. Well, I tuned into the internet. I'm an internet hearer. I watch a sermon on the internet, and wow, I got excited in the moment, and I forgot what it was. I didn't do what it said. The Word of God is here to change you. He says, Be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the Word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Now, what's it saying here when you look at your face in a glass? Tell me, what's it, what's it talking about? A mirror. a mirror. A mirror. It doesn't use the word, but that's what it means. A mirror. Now, there's a mirror on the wall over there. Uh, I would venture to say that the majority of people in here looked in a mirror this morning. Well, maybe not this guy. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> I would venture to say most of us probably checked out the mirror to make sure everything's okay before we walked out the door, right? Well, Pastor Fan, and I, I, I don't, I'm not so vain. I don't have to look in the mirror. Well, look, the mirror is so you can see your true self. So if you see a problem, you can fix it. I don't need any mirror. I don't care. Well, you know, sometimes we look in the mirror for others' sakes, don't we? In a sense, it's for your own good. And I know there's some people, you can tell they don't look in a mirror, right? <laughs> in fact, just recently, we're, on, we're traveling, we're on the road, we had to go to a Walmart. We needed something, everything else is closed. It reminded me why we don't go to Walmart on a regular basis. There are some people in there that have not looked in the mirror, right? <laughs> Whoa, you went out of the house wearing that? You look like, what are you thinking? What's wrong with you? Why would you do that? Yeah. Now, wait a minute. How many of you wake up, start your day by looking in the mirror of the Word of God, and you say, now, Lord, I know I'm weak in the flesh. And I know that I have problems I need to fix. And, Lord, just the other day I said, Lord, help me. Show me how to fix this. I need your help. And he says, perfect. I've got the tool for you. I have the fix. Go to the apothecary, right? He says, here you go. Here's what you got. Here's, all you have to do is just give me about five minutes. Start your day. Open it up. Read something. And the Holy Spirit will work through you and draw you to the Word and teach you. He'll lead you and guide you into the truth. He'll show you what to do. The words of God are spiritually discerned. If you ask the Lord for help to be in the Holy Spirit while you're reading the Word of God, He can really teach you. The problem is we're often in the flesh. What do I want? What do I need? What do I have to accomplish today? What does the boss expect of me? What bills are due? What project did I want to fish? Ooh, I, I, you know, I, I wanted to watch that YouTube video about how to do a do-it-yourself craft. None of those things are profitable spiritually. But if we'll look in this as the mirror, and we'll ask the Lord through the Holy Spirit, Lord, I need your help through the power of your Holy Spirit. Will you help me understand your Holy Word? Lord, help me to see what I need to change so I can become more like you so that I can be used more by you. The goal here is that we would all become better Christians, that we would grow spiritually inside. And God has given us a universal tool. This is like the Swiss Army knife. <laughs> Even the weapons expert would tell you the Swiss Army knife is one of the best things to carry. It's got a good blade on it and many other tools. Well, this is the mirror to see your true self. Look at verse 24. So you look in the mirror, but you don't change anything. But verse 24, For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You go to the mirror, you take a look, Ooh, i, I got to deal with that. I'm going to go my way. God says, no, look at my way. He says, no, I'm going my way. Verse 25, this is where we get the name for the church, verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, 
This man shall be blessed in his deed. You say, Pastor Fanon, why did you even name the church Law of Liberty? If Law of Liberty means Bible, why don't we just be another Bible Baptist church? Why not? There's more to it than that. It is his law. We need that. And thank God for his liberty, his grace, his mercy, right? But that perfect balance of law and liberty is the gift from God. He's given it to us through the word of God. And he says, if you will look inside of this and don't forget what you hear, don't forget what you see, but do something about that. Look at the phrase he puts here. He says, being a doer of the work. I want to be a doer of the work. Look, I'm not saved by my works. But the Lord has promised He will reward me for my works, and I want to be a doer of the work. God needs laborers in His harvest, doesn't He? He needs men and women to go out and preach the gospel and open the Bible and shine that light and to change lives. And I want to be a doer of the work. And if you do that, look what it says at the end of the verse. This man or woman shall be blessed in his deed. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Open up the Bible do the work and God will bless you. Go to Proverbs chapter 30, please. Proverbs chapter 30. The Bible is a fire. The Bible is a hammer. The Bible is a lamp. It's a light. It's an anchor. It's a mirror. The Bible is a sword. We all know that one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How do we fight our battles against the devil? With the sword of the Spirit. How do we set the captives free? It's through the power of the sword of the Spirit. This is our weapon. Hebrews 4, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a sword. Sharper than any sword. Is your Bible sharp? The Bible's also called, now here's interesting, the Bible's called milk. Milk. The Bible's called milk. It says, as newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. When somebody gets born again, just as a baby needs milk for a certain time of their life, and then that baby of yours starts reaching onto their plate and grabbing your stuff, and ultimately they go for the meat. The Bible is also called meat. Now, I th think about this. You can go down to Walmart, since we're on Walmart. Since I know everybody in here loves Walmart so much, right? You can go get you a gallon of great value, homogenized. It's going to have the recumbent bovine growth hormone built in there so it'll inflate you just like the cattle, right? And they're going to, but don't worry about any of the pus. They allow a certain level of pus in their milk. And I know I'm getting disgusting here, but don't worry, that pus won't get you because they nuke it with radiation before you drink it. So by the time you get it, it's just about like chalk with some hormones added and pus. Now, I don't want that milk. That's not the kind of milk that I want, right? As newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the word. Right? When you start out, and listen, we all still need milk. I do believe that we all still need milk. I've met people that say, well, adults shouldn't drink milk. I, I don't agree with that one. We need milk and we need meat. We need a perfect meal. And the sincere milk, if you will, it's like that farm-raised A2 raw milk. It's got that thick stuff on the top. And that's the good stuff, right? That God wants you to have the good, natural stuff. He wants you to have the best. In Hebrews 5, it says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. It goes on, it says uh, that there is strong meat. So God doesn't want you to always stay on the milk. Don't only drink the milk. There are a few in here that only drink milk. And they're allowed. They're babies. Most of us now also eat the meat. And that's important. You're in Proverbs chapter 30, is that correct? If you're in Proverbs 30, find verse number 5. Verse number 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Look, the word of God is a shield. Now wait a minute. It's our weapon that we attack with, but it's also our defense. Oh, you're just going to hide behind the Bible? Well, amen, I have something. I have a covert. I have protection. I have a fortress. I have a defense. It's the Word of God. It's the Holy Scriptures that can protect me. Against what? The fiery darts of the devil. The shield. It's called a shield. He says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them to put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. 
Don't add to the Bible. This concept is also found in Revelation at the end. It's also found in Deuteronomy in the beginning. Uh, there are those that would change the Bibles. And almost every revision committee out there, someone came up and said, oh, by the end of their life they're saying, I think we made a big mistake when we, when we changed some of that. We've changed doctrine. We changed the Word of God. Go to Proverbs 2. Go back a few pages to Proverbs chapter 2. It's an anchor. It's a mirror. It's a sword. It's a shield. It's your milk. It's your meat. It's silver. It's gold. It's treasure. It's the most valuable thing you have on this earth, I think, in some times. Proverbs chapter 2, look at verse 4. If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as hid treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and shalt find the knowledge of God. If we will treat the word of God as silver and gold, that we're going to protect it, we're not just going to leave it laying around, did you get to that? I'm not worried about it. Psalm 119, he says, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Who would like, honestly, be honest for a minute, in the flesh, who would like to have thousands of gold? Amen, of course. Who would also humble yourself and in the spirit and say, Yeah, I wish I had thousands of verses memorized. I wish I had thousands of souls to say for God's glory. Think about it. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, please. It's gold, it's silver, it's treasure. The Bible is called a rock. It is called a foundation, like a sure foundation. It is called a fortress. It is the rod of correction. It's what we need sometimes to set us straight and get back on the right course. In 1 Peter 2, verse 8, he says, A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. People stumble at the word. And here's the problem. Just as in Jeremiah's time, this was a generation that needed to hear the true word of God. They were being fed a bunch of lies and dreams and visions and false gods by false prophets. And people would stumble at the word. We live in that same generation today, unfortunately. You don't have to be offensive with the Bible. Just referencing the Bible is offensive. People will get offended. Oh, oh I don't believe in all that. Well, that's your problem. You think about the, the famous parable of the sower. He says, the seed is the word of God. What kind of seeds are you planting in your garden? What kind of seed? I mean, don't you plant in hope of seeing fruit? I hope you don't stop and uh, pick some of those weeds off the side of the road, those prickly things, you know. I mean, some of them have beautiful purple flowers, but you can't even touch the thing. It's so sharp, right? It's dangerous. You don't want your children around that. What kind of seeds are you planting? The seed is the Word of God. You're in 1 Peter 1. Look at verse number 23. Look at 1 Peter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The seed is the word of God. The parable was we go out and we throw the seed indiscriminately at people. Well, I'm an atheist. Well, let me tell you anyway what God says. You know God died for your sins? If they'll listen, I don't care what they tell me they are. If they'll listen, then I'm, I'm going to give them the seed. That's what we're called to do. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God's word is timeless. It is eternal. You know, we say, oh, I got that old-fashioned Bible. Well, no, it's not just old-fashioned. This is that everlasting Bible. These are the eternal words of the living God. In the pages, there are spirit and they are life. And if you'll read it, it will change you. If you'll let it. If you'll determine in your heart, I want it to change me. We're born again of, of not corruptible seed, but incorruptible. What kind of seeds are you using in your garden? I hope you're not using genetically modified seeds. That's not good. There are some GMO Bibles out there. If you're using the wrong Bible, you could be planting confusion in your household. You could be causing confusion or bad doctrine. You know, most Bibles out there ever since, so there's two lines of Bible up until the late 1800s. And there was a big split, because after that, from the Westcott and Hort text, you have all the other new Bibles, and they all do the same thing. They delete the word hell. They change hell. Well, it's Hades. What is that? 
It's the place of the dead. Well, what does that mean? It's just death. Well, how do you do that? When it's death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. They're deleting words out of the Bible. The word hell is deleted out of almost all of the new Bibles. The place of the dead, that doesn't really carry the same weight and power as the word hell. We know what hell is, don't we? Yeah. But your Bible may not. Matthew 20, 20 is a famous one where it says they were worshiping him. They were worshiping Jesus. The deity of Christ is under attack by the false Bibles. The other's Bible, they just say, well, he bowed down or uh, they, they uh, kneeled down to him. They take away the fact that they worshiped him because Jesus, if he is not God, he would not have received worship. Jesus is God and he made the statements very clear. Most Bibles end up deleting those statements. I am Christ. You'll find that in the right Bible. If your Bible has deleted that, then you're planting the incorruptible seed. It's not the word of God. He claimed to be Christ. Go to, go to Jeremiah 5, if you would. Go to Jeremiah 5. The Bible's a hammer, a fire, a sword, a shield, an anchor, the milk, the meat, the silver and gold. It's the, it's the seed. Did you know the Bible is like salt? Colossians 4, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. We ought to give a verse to every man that asks of our hope. It's like salt. Now, what is salt for? It's to preserve things. It's to stop retardation. It's to prevent the decay and prevent the corruption of society. The Word of God can do that. Your television show cannot. Your Reader's Digest doesn't have that power. The Encyclop Encyclopedia Britannica is powerless to present, prevent the decay of society. The Bible is also called honey. That goes down a little better than salt, doesn't it? Right? In Psalm 19.10, he says, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. God's words, when you understand it, when you get it to your soul, it's sweeter than eating fresh honey. Psalm 81, He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with the honey. Out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. It's bread, it's wheat, it's honey. Psalm 119, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. It's also called the bread of life. Job 23 says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. <clears throat> when Job woke up, he said, I want God's words more than I want just my food. Two last ones, let me give you this. Of course, it's called the living water, as Christ is. It's bread of life. It's the living water. But the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You understand God's Word is called flesh? What are you talking about? Well, the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Jesus, and He gave His Spirit to you. And through these things, we can become more like Him. We should be conformed unto the image of His Son, is what the Bible says. The, the Word has the breath of God. It's flesh and it's breath. Holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's inspired. They were inspired by the Word of God. You're in Jeremiah 5. Look at verse 13. And the prophets shall become wind. And the Word is not in them. Thus shall it be done unto them. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord, God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. What a strong statement. Now listen, he's saying that you're going to be like a fire-breathing Christian. Do you have God's words on your lips? And listen, of course we speak the truth in love. I'm not advocating for rudeness. I'm not advocating for you to be a jerk. Jesus was not a jerk. We speak the truth in love, but there's a problem. When you speak the words of God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shake people up. I ran into a guy in the elevator. He had a business shirt on, and under his logo it said John 3.16. Cool. Hey, I like your shirt, man. All right. Hey, tell me, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. All right. What do I have to do to go to heaven? Well, uh, there's all sorts of stuff. You have to repent of all your sin. You've got to get baptized. You can't. Um, and he, he's turning. I'm like, stop. John 3.16 says it's only by faith. 
this gentleman and I, we rode a few floors together and we walked the hall together and I just fired verse after verse after verse after verse. I was not trying to be rude. I was being a little bit forceful because I knew my time was short. And I consisted. I just kept telling him, it's all by faith. It's not by works. Baptism does not wash away your sins. He said that. Baptism does not wash away your sins. Otherwise, when you sin again, you've got to get baptized again. Salvation is by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you, my words were like fire to this man. He was flinching and grimacing, and we got to his door, and he stopped. And I said, do you understand what I'm saying? I see the difference, he said. I said, if you're trusting in your works, oh, no, no, it's not by works. I said, sir, you're telling me you have to stop sinning and be baptized to be saved. And he goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. I said, then you're not saved. Well, well, you have a good night. Sad. I pray that my words like fire, that God's words through me in the scriptures like fire went down into that man's soul. And I told him, I'm going to be praying that the Lord reveal this to you. I pray that those verses would get down in his soul and cause him to question and doubt and understand he's been listening to the false prophets. He, he's heard a false prophecy. Someone's given him a dream, but not the word of God. When you have the word of God, you give it faithfully. Go to Jeremiah chapter 20. Go to Jeremiah chapter 20. In Jeremiah's generation, it was a generation that was offended just at the mention of the Word of God. They wanted anything but. They wanted their ears tickled. And you know what? They needed to hear the truth. They needed to hear God's words. That was the only solution. Jeremiah chapter 20, find verse number 8. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and derision daily. He's saying, I spoke the word and people hated me. They came after me. Look at verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Forbearing means to put it off, to stop. He said, I got weary with not speaking, and I just couldn't stay that way. I had to open my mouth and speak. If you noticed earlier in Jeremiah, he said, I'll put the words in your mouth as fire. Here he says, I'm just, you know, it's offending them, and they're hating me. I'm not going to say it anymore. And the words was in my heart like a fire before it even got to his mouth. In Psalm 69, he says, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. He was fired up. He was sold out. He understood he had a message he had to give. If you would, go to Hebrews 4. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Again, the, the text we started with in Jeremiah 23. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. That's our job. God says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and as a hammer that breaketh the rock in the pieces? I would encourage you to get fired up about the words of God. Get them in your heart. Get them in your life. If you have to schedule it so that you can make it happen, that's what you need to do. If you need a pocket Bible, we have small ones back there. If you need an extra Bible, we have big ones. Well, you need to do what you need to do to get this into your heart and into your mind. If you want the audio Bible, I have it downloaded. I'll give it to you. But we have to get it in our heart. Hebrews 4.12, look at this. We're almost done. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What's he saying? Quick means alive. You heard of the quick and the dead. It's the living and the dead. It is the living word of God. God it abideth forever. Like I said, it's not old-fashioned. This is the everlasting gospel. It's current. It's important. It's relevant for today. It's quick. He says it's powerful. The word of God will give you the strength to walk by faith. It's the strength for life, it's called. It'll give you the spiritual facts that you need in your heart. He says it's sharp. He says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And listen, I tell you, the, the King James Bible is the only one that has not, uh, doesn't have deleted verses or changed doctrine on hell and salvation. It is perfect. It's preserved. It's flawless. It's not missing anything. And I encourage you, prove it yourself. Prove it yourself. This is something I had to do later in life. I was raised King James. 
And then later in life, I started using another version. I went to a different church and everything's changing. And one day I opened up a parallel Bible and it changed my life when I saw what the NIV said compared to what the King James said. And at this point in my life, I was ignorant of the history of the translations. And I, I wanted to know. I would not rest that night until I found, I, I was going down the rabbit trail. This was back when the, when the internet was real slow. But I mean, I did what I had to do. I was up all night. I wanted to know from Bible to Bible to Bible, what happened? What's the difference? Because when two things are different, they're not the same. And when it's not the same, it's teaching something completely different. One is the Word of God, and one has been changed by man, by the will of man. And that's not God's Word. He says it's sharper. He says, dividing asunder. A sword has that power, a, boy, a real sword, like a man's sword. You know, you could probably split this whole pulpit with it in one swing, couldn't you? Dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Joints and marrow. That's the flesh and the spirit. It's the Bible that helps us to see when we're in the flesh, when we're in the spirit, to discern how to handle the flesh, how to grow in the spirit. But separation, asunder, and you know, the Bible will help us to become more separate from the world and the false prophets of this world. It'll teach us separation. A discerner, he says, we're ending with this. A discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hearing God's word, listening to God's word, reading God's word. This is how the Holy Spirit works in your mind and in your heart to teach you things. And this is what we need. I would encourage you to fall in love, get on fire for listening to God's Word, for reading God's Word. You have to prove this to yourself. The effect of being sold out for God's Word, it will revive you. It will encourage you. It will convict you of your sin. It will teach you. It will reprove you. It will show you the right direction to go. In Jude 1, he says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by flesh. You understand, one last thing, this is a fire. This is, the, the words are like a fire, and we fight fire with fire. You know people that are going to hell, and we pull them out of the fire with the fire of the Word of God. Do you want to learn how to use the fire a little better? How to use the hammer, the sword, the shield? The salt, the bread, the milk, the meat. I would encourage you to do whatever you have to do, to sacrifice whatever you have to sacrifice to get out of your life. He says that it's all profitable for doctrine, for reproof, it's correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is your guide in life. We say it jokingly, but I love it. B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving earth. You never know when your time is up, but don't wait for that. Why don't you right now just commit in your heart and say, you know what, I will get better at studying and preaching the Word of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Word. Lord, thank you that we can trust your Word. Lord, thank you that you can, um, uh, you've given us a church where we can hear it preached and read and we can worship you through song. Lord, I just pray that you would give us all the wisdom and the ability to get more of your word in our life and get fired up for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.